Hi, I'm Sarah Grace McCandless, and this is On Brand, where we take a closer look at the desire for a true connection between people and the companies that they engage with. My guest today is a true expert when it comes to community. And I think you're gonna be really fascinated by what that word means and what the different iterations are. And what does it mean when we're thinking about applying true community in more of a brand consumer setting? Uh, Carrie Melissa Jones is a community strategist and author of Building Brand Communities, and she's here to speak with us today. Carrie, welcome to On Brand. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am so excited to have you. I consider myself a voracious reader. I'm just going to show, for those who are watching um, versus just listening, this is your book and this is what I've done to it. And I'm going to clean it up to make it real pretty for our conversation, but it is just, <laughs> you can see this, it's just a posty post note bonanza going on here. Yay. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, I couldn't, I felt like uh, at one point, like just minutes into it, because I was listening to it too. I got the audio book and I bought the hard copy and it was like really great because I would run to the hard copy and then stick the post-it note in there from what I was listening to. Wealth of knowledge. Um, first things first, before we get into the book and the discussion about community, tell me a little bit about your background um, and how you came to be such an expert in the space. Yeah, so I have been building online communities since the early days of the internet. Um, I discovered online communities specifically when I was a teenager. It was a little bit awkward, <laughs> like many teenagers, um, and extremely shy, almost to the point of it being painful for me to speak um, to adults, to even my peers. And so I discovered online communities as a way to bridge um, bridge the way that I felt and and to create friendships around the world in a really, really lonely time in my life. So that's really the groundwork and the bedrock of everything that I do is thinking back to those early experiences and what they enabled for me, which was to create friendships that were deep and meaningful and that were about being a fan of uh, music groups, and in, in my case, emo music, um, but were you know, much, much deeper than that as well. So that's, again, that's the foundation. And then I didn't know that this was a job <laughs> that one could have is building community for a brand professionally. I didn't realize that until around 2012, 2011. And I saw, I looked around, I saw, I was in San Francisco, Pinterest, Airbnb, all these hot startups. Um, they had community managers. And I just reached out to these people who are community managers at these companies. And they were some of the nicest, kindest people I'd ever met in my life. Um, and the rest is, is history. I, the, the day that I attended my first community manager meetup was the day that I decided this was the work I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. I love that. Um, and I love that kind of origin story of community too. Okay. Let's talk about the word. Um, let's talk about this lexicon. So uh, this book, one of the things that just blew my mind was uh, there is a, basically there's a the, reinvented a dictionary for me and I've been using some of these words correctly. And then in other cases, to be totally honest with you, I'm like, mm, nope, wasn't using that one. Right. <laughs> there's a lot to learn here. We won't get through all of it today. But I think first things first is the word community. You mentioned community managers, the San Francisco scene, the startup. I relate to that. I um, my previous roles, agency side, we called them community managers as well. Let's talk about the word community. How do you define that word at its core? Yeah, um, we can get in a whole other conversation about the title, <laughs> the job title, community manager. Um, so community is something that we all know inherently as human beings. It is uh, our need to belong is a fundamental human need, just as much as shelter, water, food. Um, so community is really just a group of people who care about one another's mutual welfare. So care about, you know, whether they're sick or whether they're healthy, care about their well-being in general. So that's what community is. We have that through our less and less through our neighborhoods uh, where we live. We have it through maybe you're part of a, a startup community in Portland where you know the people there and you care about their success. Um, 
in our families, but a brand community is something just a little bit slightly different uh, than that. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, as you're speaking, I'm relating, I'm nodding, I'm thinking, yep, I am. Women in tech in Portland, part of that community. Mm -hmm. Another huge community for me is my dance community, mm -hmm. um, my yoga community, yeah. community I live in. I live in the Williams neighborhood here in Portland. That's a little different than brand. Tell me about brand community. Yeah, so first we have to define brand because mm -hmm. That is also one of those words that people struggle with and struggle to define. So for, for Charles and I in this book, we define brand as any identifiable organization. So that can be a school, that can be a nonprofit, it can be you know, a giant for-profit like Oracle. Brands are not just you know, the, the Nikes of the world. We all have brands in, today, in today's day and age. So um, that's what, we define brand as. So a brand community is any group where people care about one another's uh, mutual, they mutually care about one another's welfare and they are brought together, organized and stewarded by an organization. So by a brand. So that's really the only fundamental difference is that these communities are cemented around the shared values and purpose of an organization versus just coming together because of the same geography or, um, you know, just going through a similar life experience at the same time, or there's a lot of health communities, things like that. Um, th th that's just the fundamental difference, but it's not as different as we make it seem. Yeah, I, that's a re really interesting breakdown of that too. And again, the, you know, gosh, semantics, words, definitions, I live for this. So I'm, it gets me really excited. And I love the way that you walk us through that. So you mentioned uh, brand and that a lot of us can have, brand can mean a lot of different things. There is, of course, that association when it comes to marketing. What is your point of view in terms of marketing and community? Can they go hand in hand? Should they go hand in hand? And if so, how? Yeah, so this is a really complex and urgent question because of what we're going through right now with the COVID pandemic and a lot of brands jumping in and saying, you know, we can fill the gap. We can, you know, help connect you during this time. So um, I do think marketing and community can go hand in hand. I also think often they are at odds and that they are even within organizations, these teams are fighting. Actually, I see it a lot in my work, um, just a disrespect from both um, departments like community and marketing, or there might be one community manager on a marketing team who doesn't get respect. Um, so really how they can go hand in hand is by creating authentic connection through your marketing. And this is something that I think a lot of people who work in marketing aspire to do. They say it in words, but then the actual investment goes toward, you know, how do we get as many leads as possible into our pipeline or, you know, a numbers game, more for more sake. And so if we kind of pull that back a little bit and think about, okay, the more will come if we invest authentically in creating a shared purpose for our people that are important to us and bringing them together of course, more will come. Loyalty will come. Your NPS scores will rise. All of that comes as a result of this authentic connection. So that's how they can go hand in hand, but they often don't right now. And this is something we need to fix at our organizations. You know, this really ties into another conversation I have on the show with Maury Fontanez, who's the CEO of 822 Group, and she does transformational leadership and coaching and talks about purpose and starting with, like, if you don't know your why as a leader and as an organization, you're really starting off, like, with no compass, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and then that helps with the authenticity how how do you get to that authenticity? I mean, how do you become more than just words on a page or on a website or, you know, painted on a wall in an office when we all go back there someday? How do you bring <laughs> meaning and really drive authenticity as a brand in these community scenarios? That is a fantastic question um, and one that no one has actually asked me up to this point um, with this book coming out. So how do you actually do it at an organization? Um, you don't, you have to start with the purpose. So to your point um, with the CEO that you mentioned, 
purpose is something that people write out and they don't live by it. And so what ends up happening is you have a purpose statement, this big why for why you might exist or why your community might exist. And then your individual contributors on your team or your managers will start to put together, okay, I'm in a marketing team. So here are my marketing metrics. And then I'm going to create tactics that can um, you know, drive those metrics. And that's completely divorced from that purpose. So the way that we get to actually taking action based on purpose is starting with that why and then thinking about, okay, what do our people need? The people that we want to gather, what do they need right now? How can we create value for them that they can't create alone? What do we, what resources do we have access to that they don't? And how do we share that more widely? Mm -hmm. And then your, that's how you create the actual strategy. And then you create those tactics from there. And then you create metrics. So one of the things I see, I actually just um, started working with a client who works underneath a uh, head of growth marketing. And she sent me her 2021 planning documents. And there were about 50 different metrics that she was planning to measure, which on its own is like, I just can't imagine keeping up with that and also prioritizing it. Mm -hmm. And then she had created tactics that were supposed to drive those metrics when instead we really should have thought about, okay, what is meaningful engagement here? How do we meaningfully engage people? How do we deliver um, what, what it is that they need? And then what are the tactics that we need to employ mm -hmm. to actually do that work? So that's how we need to flip the way that we're actually doing strategy and execution. Yeah, it got me thinking it's a little cart before the horse, right? Like it's exactly. leading yeah, with the metrics first. I I mean, I I love what you're saying here. I, I speak about this a lot too in my own conversations, is I also feel like that there's a lot you can learn from listening to your consumer. They don't necessarily define who you are as an organization or company or brand, but they can tell you, you know, where you're hitting the mark or missing the mark, right? So is is that does that prove true in your experience as well? And how do you go about um, listening and effect effectively? Yeah, another great question. Um, so, yes, um, we need to be talking to our customers, to our stakeholders, whether that's you know in a norm on a nonprofit, maybe um, you know people who are donors and funders. Um, we need to be talking to them. We're not necessarily, especially when I do community strategy work, not necessarily asking them, you know, what are the ways that we've failed in the past, failed you? Because people will, um, you know, they'll share that freely most of the time. Um, but I noticed that a lot of the leaders I work with are really afraid of opening up that conversation. And I don't think it's necessarily going to lead to somewhere productive. So instead of that, we ask, more about their lives as whole human beings. Like what, what is it, how else do you identify beyond just um, you know, the way that we know you today? What else is important to you? Um, what is your schedule like on a daily basis? Uh, what, are your, what are your challenges? Where are you, are you having um, immediate problems right now? So I had a client do this recently and they found out that a bunch of their members cared about animal welfare, even though that has nothing to do, they were a real estate organization. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it has nothing to do with anything um, that they currently are gathering around. Yeah. But that opens up this whole opportunity of like, okay, how do we actually gather these people who care about the same thing to create more good in the world um, to, for animal welfare, right? Um, so. Of course, you can't do all of the things, but even just opening up these conversations is critical to understanding your customers and your stakeholders beyond just that transactional shallow level. Yeah, and I guess it's a thinking not just about yourself, but about the interests of somebody. It's so relationship driven, isn't it? Yeah. Because I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm like, am I, this feels like things I should apply to my personal life too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, sure. like, you know, don't come in and start talking about how great you are and like well, how great your products are. Ask questions and find out what their other interests are and their needs. And there actually might be a very natural way to bring these things together, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually had a boss. I worked under a, a marketing a CMO at one point, and I had a boss who said, um, We need you to talk to people and understand how to make them love us. And that was, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I was very young at the time. <laughs> I, you know, took this very seriously. And, um, 
you know, like that's not, first of all, that's not something that you can quantitatively measure. Um, there's NPS and other ways that you might be able to boil that down a little bit, but um, starting there is like, imagine if you had, you're dating someone new and they say to you like, how do I make you love me? <laughs> um, like that sounds really, really desperate and it's just not going to lead to most likely to that loving relationship that that person's looking for. If instead we're genuinely interested in building a relationship and we're genuinely interested in ways that we can um, expand how we serve people, then we can create a relationship in which love might actually more naturally organically occur. <laughs> oh, for sure. I'm sitting here laughing because I'm like, oh, I was in that relationship. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but you make such a great point too. And it's like, uh, it kind of leads me to, we've used the word engagement as well. Um, you talk about it a lot in the book too. Um, and what, it, again, it's one of those words that has sort of a core meaning and then layers in different executions. So let's talk about engagement at its core. And then again, if you could put your spin on it through more of that brand consumer lens, um, what makes an engagement meaningful versus empty? Yeah. So we define engagement. Um, we define engagement as two different in two different ways. One is meaningful engagement and one is empty engagement. Mm -hmm. So empty engagement is just engagement for engagement's sake. And unfortunately, uh, we have come as a from in many business cultures, we have come to associate engagement with attention and they are not the same thing, at least not when we're building community. So just because you have someone's eyeballs doesn't mean that you um, are meaningfully engaging them. So what is meaningful engagement is any way that we can bring people together to one, knit relationships between members, and then two, to uh, connect more deeply to the purpose of the entire organization or the entire community. So if it doesn't serve one of those two purposes, people or purpose, um, then what we're doing is most likely creating this empty engagement, which again, steals people's attention, but doesn't necessarily add value to their lives. Yeah, you talk in the book specifically, look, I, there was an example about pizza. Um, yeah. <laughs> and about, I'm like, oh, surprise, I remember the food, the food example. <laughs> oh, pizza. But I'm like, I was nodding, I was out walking my dog and I was nodding while I was listening to it because I'm like, yes, this is exactly right. Like just giving away free pizza, like, is that in, is it meaningful? Do, do, are people gonna keep talking about the time, the one time you gave them a, free piece of pizza versus maybe something like, um, you know, you, you know, found out a store. I don't know. I'm making this up as we go along, but like, you know, it was more about you delivered pizzas to, you know, a medical facility that's been working all night long, you know, working with patients. COVID. I don't know. To me, like, that's just a little bit, yes, I'm feeding you, but it's more about mm -hmm. like rewarding. Is that a good example? A little bit of a spin on that just versus come in today for your free slice of pizza. Yeah, exactly. So, the, that example is Charles's example. I will <laughs> give him full credit for it. Um, so yeah, the example is, you know, of course you could get a lot of people to show up if you are giving away free pizza and um, people love free pizza. It's why I went to a lot of uh, meetups in my <laughs> early twenties because I wanted exactly. free pizza. <laughs> um, but am I still engaged in those groups? No. So right. instead it's about, okay, how might we bring people together around a shared purpose in a safe space where we can actually move toward that shared purpose together. And, and because of that purpose, how might our invitations change? How might we um, think about the guest list and who actually should be there more? And like you said, pizza is just an added benefit. Of course, bringing people together over food is like the foundation of community. Um, food is a great uh, bonder of people, but uh, if we're just giving food and no other context, then um, it's it's very, very empty. Yeah, I agree with that too. And I think it's, it's kind of a nice tie in to this idea of the actions that we take and the connections that we are trying to build and this idea, this North Star of you know brand advocacy, which you talk about in the book, it's one of my little posties here where you say, many brands invest in advocacy efforts that misunderstand how and why members mobilize. And then it goes, I mean, again, I mean, I, I really feel like this book is my new degree. Um, I want to go to the University of Carrie and Charles. Um, and I want to graduate with flying like, with the high honors too, but <laughs> brand advocacy. So I spend a lot of my time working with my partners, my brand partners on this too. It's a huge focus. I look at things like awareness and 
you know, knowing who you are and how do you show up during the entire relationship? And then how, you know, how can you authentically build that advocacy? Where does advocacy sit in, in the world and your experience in terms of community? So in terms of community, so what I see a lot in a lot of advocacy programs is this more transactional kind of relationship. So it's, you do something, we give you points, or we give you a badge, or, um, you know, you get some kind of recognition. That's not necessarily deeply meaningful. Um, it might be, again, meaningful in this kind of momentary uh, situation where I know, like, you can use the points and, and turn them into let's say a branded water bottle or whatever, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. great. Um, but instead thinking about it as not about the transactional piece, but rather how do you actually bring people together over again, that purpose, and then reward them for actions that they would otherwise take willingly um, because they care about that purpose, not because they want points or a badge. That mm -hmm. should just be the added cherry on top. Otherwise people will start to associate all the actions they're taking with an actual value. When you start to put an actual value on someone's contribution, that's when you get into some really, really uh, dicey territory that frankly, you don't want to be in. <laughs> I've, I've been there, I've built communities based on uh, gift cards and points before. Mm -hmm. And we had to completely re-engineer the, um, the experience because it's not sustainable. Yeah, I mean, I find, you know, I certainly, I, I know that I'm still a part of some of those programs. Ulta comes to mind. I'm like, yeah. oh, oh, how many do I have? You know, I just, but it's not, it's not really the driver for why I would shop at an Ulta. For me, it really, you know, I've, I tell a lot of stories. I use them as anecdotes in a lot of my meetings and conversations. They come from a place of truth and it all relates back to my experience with a company or a brand. And it doesn't, it's very rarely is it about the part where they gave me something for free. A recent example, I had a, a thing with Quip. I used their toothbrush. It just went off like for no reason at 6 a.m. I tweeted about it, sort of made a joke about it, said there was a ghost in my toothbrush. They said, <laughs> um, they were great. They came back to me and they said, we'll bust that ghost for you. I'm like, nice, uh, <laughs> got the reference, took it offline. And then without me even asking, replaced my toothbrush. I didn't ask for that and had it shipped to me. It's coming today, as a matter of fact. So <laughs> I'm going to tell this story a million times. And you know what? It's not about the free toothbrush. It was about the way that they sort of heard me. And I know they heard me by the way that they replied to me too. So I don't know. I'm wondering, like, do you have any examples of companies that you think are really getting it right when it comes to a facet of community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that quick, quick example is great. I so what they're doing is, um, you know, social customer support, right? Mm -hmm. And it it's it's about building that relationship, more of a conversation between the brand and and the customer. Mm -hmm. So community takes that a step deeper. So if this brand were to actually start to bring you in to talk about maybe innovations around toothbrushes, I don't know, <laughs> whatever it might be, um, or dental health, or there's a community about dental health. Um, I'm not saying that's a good idea, Quip. <laughs> <Don't take that. laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. So they would actually take that and, and sustain that relationship with you over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would get to know members of their team, of their uh, other members within that community and really start to build a long-term relationship. So um, now I'm forgetting what your question was. Oh, this is, this is, <laughs> that's my example, Quip, you know, um, I'm really obsessed with a company called Care of right now, yes. uh, with vitamins and stuff. They so personalized, amazing user experience, customer experience. Like I just, I want to ask them to go to prom with me pretty much. <laughs> So is there a, a brand that you think is really getting it right? I loved how you broke that down, that the first step is sort of that social engagement, brand love, customer service. The next step would be to bring me into an ongoing community. Mm -hmm. Is there a company that you think uh, comes to mind as a good example of how they're doing that? Yeah, uh, Airbnb, hands down. Mm -hmm. I've been so inspired and impressed by their work over you know the last seven or so, eight years that they've been in business, they've been a huge inspiration in my work. Um, 
but most recently actually, so they've been building a, an Airbnb host community and a super host community in particular for years and years and years. It was part of baked into one of their earliest hires was a community manager. And that community manager was actually the former community manager of Yelp. So um, she was, she had already done some of this work for a different kind of purpose. Mm -hmm. And then she was, she was just rocket <laughs> fuel basically for Airbnb. Um, and that was important at the very, very earliest stages to build those relationships with hosts because it's going to be a long-term relationship. Hopefully you don't want to have a bunch of churn in listings. Um, so they've been doing that and investing in that for years. They've invested not only in relationship building, flying their community managers out all over the world to meet people, to host meetups in, in places, but then also they've invested in technology. Mm -hmm. They have for, I think it was in 2014, they invested in a huge overhaul of their super host forums. And they now actually, they employ an entire agency called Standing on Giants that works with them wow. to engage that community online. It's about, they do, of course, they do customer support in that forum, but it's really about hosts helping other hosts become better at what they do. They also have events that they run. Um, they were doing these huge travel around the world um, skill building conferences prior to uh, COVID. <laughs> um, and their product managers were actually going and changing things in the product because of what they learned by interacting, not necessarily by asking them, what do you want to see here? Mm -hmm. But by truly interacting with people and seeing the ways in which they wanted to connect with others and hearing that in their own words. And then they, to top all of this off, they just IPO'd last, I think it was Friday was when they IPO'd. Um, and they actually let their super hosts in on the IPO. So they were able right. to buy IPO shares wow. before anyone else. Like this is not only have they built a community that's incredible from the value standpoint of these hosts are making more money uh, when they're hosting because they're getting better at what they do and they're having more joy because of the mm -hmm. interactions that they can create. But now they're actually part of the financial success. They've financially given back to that community. That to me is the model of what businesses can and should ethically, morally do in the future. And that's going to be a big, big shift mm -hmm. for organizations. Um, but the ones doing it are, they're going to be around for a very long time. Yeah, that's a great example. It's so interesting to break down Airbnb because you've got your host and then your your guests. And then of course, there's Airbnb, Airbnb experiences too. Yeah. So, but if you're not getting it right with the host, guests are not going to come at all, right? So, yeah. so smart. I love that you use this example too. And you started to touch on it at the end there. I mean, so we're talking about a, co a company that is rooted in travel and experiences. And, you know, this last year, we haven't been doing much of that. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think, what, what are some of your thoughts as we kind of wrap things up, um, you know, as we look forward to 2021 and the role that community plays um, now more important than ever, it seems, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think this has opened a lot of people's eyes to the frustrations of virtual connection, but also the power of virtual connection. And this is something I've been beating the drum on for years that online communities are not the be all end all. They are not better or worse than offline communities either. Um, they are just another way to connect. And you know, the fact that I could be talking with you in Portland right now, um, mm -hmm. and I'm part of an online community where I gather with women from Africa, uh, from parts of Asia, Europe, like we are all able to come together and have dance parties on a Sunday morning <laughs> together. That's insane. <laughs> like I'm thinking about my ancestors, it would just blow their mind. Um, so that's what's possible now. So what we need to start thinking about is not, okay, we throw all of our eggs into the online community basket, but rather this is possible oh my gosh, this is a huge possibility. Let's invest in this and continue to do our in-person relationship building, our offline events. Maybe you run a company conference, but how do you sustain the engagement that happens at those touch points? That's through the online community. You can start to create relationships there. They get cemented and strengthened in person, and then they're cemented and strengthened even more on the online community. And then you're constantly bringing people in um, to this deeper relationship with the brand and with one another 
to create all kinds of new value that you never could have dreamed about prior. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like, you know, there is opportunity out of crisis, we often, you know, comes the sort of revelation, right, or realization, maybe a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in your book, you cover a lot of different areas about how community can serve organizations, you touch on things like innovation and talent recruitment, customer retention, customer service, um, building transformational movements. Um, you know, which of these pillars, is there one more impacted than the other in the past year or one that you think will kind of pull forward in terms of priority among these and how, how have they been impacted as a whole? Hmm. They have all absolutely without question been impacted mm -hmm. um, from innovation. I know um, I'm working right now with a big uh, beauty client. They create beauty products. The way that they innovate has completely changed because of COVID. They right. can't do the things that they used to do. Um, and so that has been completely overhauled. Uh, community movements have changed and uh, we're now seeing movements go beyond like these hashtags and actually into deeply organized and sustained um, efforts by organizers. So the Black Lives Matter movement being one fantastic example. Um, and so we've got that. Uh, your talent ret retention and recruitment has completely shifted because how you hire is now different because of COVID. Um, but also the possibilities of who you can hire has changed because of COVID. And the way you can build community with potential hires and even with your alumni of your um, of your organizations has changed. So mm -hmm. I don't know which one would be the most impacted. Um, I, yeah, I, maybe marketing, maybe marketing because we're really flipping like I said earlier, like we're having to flip how we do strategy right? from the just more, more, more to the, the faith that we will get to more, more, more if we invest more intentionally and properly in these relationships, because the transactional, you know, it works for Amazon, but like <laughs> Amazon is Amazon. Um, it's not going to work for small businesses, direct to consumer businesses and, and many SaaS companies. So it's just all shifting and changing. Yeah. And I mean, again, this is sort of a foundational conversation here. Um, so much more to talk about, but I think it's a great starting point. You've given us so many different insights to think about and consider. And I really think it speaks to, you know, we are at a time where how, how brands, how companies show up or don't right now can really make or break them and, and consideration for community in an authentic way. Um, again, seems to be at the forefront. Um, your book, Building Brand Communities, I can't, I cannot recommend this enough. I feel like this is one, I'm not kidding, this is so true. I'm like, I'm your brand fan right now. <laughs> I'm the team on this. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge in here. And it's one of those things where, I mean, again, I was listening and reading at the same time. And I know I'm like, I'm going to go back. And you, it's like when you rewatch a movie and you just keep finding more and more, you know, that's how I felt. So I, I can't recommend that enough to everyone to check this out. Um, Carrie, I hope that you'll come back and discuss um, more about community with us in the future as well. There's so much more to dive in on. We didn't even talk about the term community manager. So <laughs> I know. We'll pick up next time. But thank you so much for your your incredible insights um, and your time. And uh, really enjoyed this conversation with you. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. Thanks.